Who are some of the corrupt cops we covered in 2023? Let's get right to it with this marathon video. Number six, the unwinnable war. Former Drug Enforcement Administration Special Agent Jose Irizarry received a sentence of over 12 years in prison for operating a money laundering and fraud scheme during his time as an agent. Irizarry, apparently confused as to what his job actually was, funneled millions of dollars from undercover DEA money laundering investigations and accepted $1 million in bribes and kickback payments. Working with his wife, Natalia Gomez Irizarry, the couple was involved in a seven-year scam where they funneled $9 million from DEA undercover money laundering investigations. The couple then moved the money into bank accounts that their co-conspirators could access. Irizarry lived it up like Tony Montagna. He bought top seats at sporting events, overspent on fine dining, and traveled all over. He bought his wife a Tiffany diamond ring, purchased several luxury sports cars, and bought a $767,000 home in Cartagena, a Colombian resort city. It was the modest lifestyle of a dirty cop. Once he was caught, Irizarry quickly threw co-workers under the bus in an attempt to save his own skin. He was like a child whining because they were the ones in trouble for taking cookies. Irizarry, turning snitch, claimed he worked with many other agents, prosecutors, informants, and even cartel smugglers. Irizarry's group, Team America, chose cities that would be their money laundering pickups. Team America partied hard, paying for VIP rooms at gentlemen's clubs, enjoying Amsterdam's red light district, and chartering a Colombian yacht. We imagine they probably brought a few pets home, and we don't mean doggies and kitties. Irizarry rationalized that a large part of their corruption came from the belief that the DEA was incapable of ever stopping the drug war. This defeatist attitude led to the new strategy of, if you can't beat them, join them. And they stopped trying to fight the war and found a way to profit from it instead. While former colleagues have dismissed Irizarry of making up stories to reduce his sentence, the U.S. Justice Department started investigating his allegations and interviewed dozens of current and former DEA agents and prosecutors. At best, his colleagues were ignorant or turned a blind eye, but at worst, they were also a part of the operation. In the indictment, Irizarry looked like the sole corrupt agent and mastermind behind the whole scheme, but if his stories are to be believed, he just had the misfortune of being caught. One of the other people accused was George Zumberos, who often traveled for money laundering investigations and was accused of enjoying access to commission funds that he used for personal purchases and trips. Authorities also subpoenaed George's brother, Michael Zumberos, a photographer who traveled with the agents. Michael would have been granted immunity for his cooperation but he refused to testify, leading to his imprisonment for civil contempt. Zumberoso's lawyer implied his client was only jailed because prosecutors wanted to bring more indictments due to the embarrassment they had faced over the whole scandal. Irizarry received a 12-year prison sentence and since his arrest wrote the self-published book Getting Back on Track, where he owned up to his mistakes. When his legal troubles began, his wife began seeking a divorce. We guess a corrupt, philandering DEA snitch doesn't make for a good husband. For a deeper dive into Irizarry's story, click the link here. Number five, playing it safe. Bradley Francis, a London Metropolitan Police officer, stole 1,500 pounds from a safe to settle his credit card debts. It was the most irresponsible way to be responsible. He took the money from Stoke Newington Police Station, East London. Francis accessed the safe by pretending that a member of the public had turned in 50 pounds to be placed in the locker. He then used a police pullover to cover his actions, because that never looked suspicious, reaching in, grabbing a stack of cash, then just walking out like Ocean's Eleven. When they noticed that money was missing, Francis's co-workers checked the security camera footage and caught him in the act. That one small action cost him his marriage, home, and career. Francis's family says they would have stepped in to help him pay off the credit card debt, but he was too proud to ask for help. Within 30 minutes, he settled his debt, but he had to resign as a police constable because of it. In London's Southwark Crown Court, the judge lectured Francis for abusing his position and taking advantage of the public's trust in police officers. Until he stole the money, Francis 
Davis had been a well-respected member of the police force. His colleagues vouched for his character and contribution to society, making it clear that he acted out of desperation. Francis pleaded guilty to the charge of theft by employee. In the security camera footage, he spent a long time hovering in front of the safe before he put the money under his fleece, likely contemplating his actions. The cash he took was public money from an ongoing intent to supply investigation. At the time, he was the only person with access to the safe. In court, Francis was remorseful, but the judge still sentenced him to 10 months in prison and gave him three months to pay back the money he stole. In his efforts to erase his debt, Francis earned himself a new one. Having lost his job as a policeman, Francis's father planned on hiring him at the family firm once he finished the sentence. Ironically, if he'd asked his father for help in the first place, he would have never had to go to prison. Number four, sweepstakes scammer. The Allen Lottery Scheme Organization, also referred to as ALSO, was an international lottery fraud scam that preyed on vulnerable and elderly Americans. The organization was named after Shelly and Shireen Allen, a Jamaican policewoman that ran the operation. A Wisconsin woman known as Victim One lost $150,000 and her home blew the whole thing wide open. The victim received a call from someone claiming to be a representative of the publisher's clearinghouse and even played background music, which made her believe it was real. The representative told her she'd won a house, a Mercedes Benz, and $18 million. She was told to keep it secret from the bank when she deposited the money. That advice makes more sense when it comes to dealing with your moocher of a brother, not the bank. Representatives contacted her over many months to instruct her to send cash, checks, and money orders to people in the U.S. and Jamaica. They told her she was paying fees to receive her winnings, and she was so convinced she sold her house to make a $30,000 payment. Overall, also defrauded at least 20 elderly Americans out of at least $1.69 million. The group specifically targeted elderly U.S. citizens who had money. Allen spent most of the stolen money on shopping trips. Prosecutors claimed she worked with six co-conspirators to move the funds through multiple accounts. Allen was arrested in Florida in February 2022 and charged for running also. While they were arresting her, police discovered that she was also a drug mule. When Allen was arrested, authorities found packages of powdery contraband hidden on her during their pat down. She was literally covered in it. They took her to the hospital after asking if she had swallowed any of it, and she said yes. There, she regurgitated 90 pellets of that substance, carrying a street value of over $37,000. She was ultimately sentenced to almost three years for the drug charges. The hero cop is still awaiting sentencing for stealing from old people. Number three, extra duty scheme. Four police officers, David Cilio, Paul Pavia, Mark Liggy, and Christopher Bromes took part in a scheme where they claimed the money for canceled extra duty project fees. The officers submitted at least 643 false payroll vouchers, which amounted to $187,618. The utility company that paid the money was an affiliate of Eversource, which regularly hired off-duty officers for security. Cilio, Pavia, Leggy, and Bromes worked in the division that administers the extra duty program. According to the police union rules, contractors that cancel a job later than 10 p.m. the previous day had to pay four hours of the officer's time. Part of the city's contract with the police union stipulated that jobs were offered to police officers first. Investigators were auditing the process used to assign jobs to off-duty officers, such as direct traffic and construction sites or providing security at events when they notice something unusual. Few officers seem to be collecting a large number of cancellation fees. Extra duty work paid $68 an hour and the jobs the officers claimed the fees for were never assigned to them. Assistant Police Chief James Matheny began an inquiry into the possibility that at least two officers, Cilio and Pavia, had submitted vouchers improperly for canceled jobs. The Internal Affairs Division found suspicious vouchers from Liggy and Bromes as well. To make matters worse, the officers were veterans of the force. Cilio and Pavia had been Stamford police officers for 29 years. Liggy had been with the department for 33 years, and Bromes had spent 21 years with the department. The investigation found that the only sergeant to receive vouchers for canceled jobs was Bromes with 34 vouchers. The other officers had far more. Cilio had 256, Pavia had 221, and Liggy had 132. In June 2019, the group was arrested. All four face charges of first-degree larceny and conspiracy to commit first-degree larceny, which seems redundant, but okay, throw the book at them. Judge Gary White approved accelerated rehabilitation for Cilio, Pavia, and Liggy. The pretrial program is offered to people accused of non-violent crime. You are eligible for
for the program if they help provide information against Christopher Brooms. White said the original charges against them would be dropped if they committed no other crimes during the six-month period. Each officer also had to make a $10,000 contribution to their chosen charity. While the three officers falsely claimed extra duty vouchers, they handed the paperwork to Brooms, who failed to record the required paperwork and oversaw the office. Number two, everyone's scamming. Over 131 people participated in one of the most significant disability fraud cases in U.S. history. The participants included 72 former New York City police officers and eight former firefighters. The scam operated for two decades and stole over $400 million in taxpayer money. The plot began in 1988 when four facilitators coached hundreds of applicants on ways to convince the Social Security Administration that they were entitled to monthly disability payments as they had psychiatric conditions that made them unable to work. Many retired police officers and firefighters began to feign mental illnesses to receive benefits. Some pretended they suffered post-traumatic stress after the 9-11 attacks. Long Island resident Raymond Lavallee was the wizard behind the curtain. He represented the applicants and coached them into making false claims, and they learned from him how to work the system and get fraudulent benefits. Lavallee could have received a maximum of 25 years on top of the original grand larceny, but in turn for his assistance with case, he received a one-year prison sentence and was ordered to pay $2 million in restitution. Lavalle, like any good ringleader, had minions. How could he be a ringleader without an actual ring to leave? John Minerva, former Nassau County Assistant District Attorney and retired police officer, helped Lavalle orchestrate the scheme. Thomas Hale and Joseph Esposito assisted them. The group coached NYPD officers, firefighters, and corrections officers into making the fraudulent claims. Some suspects received hundreds of thousands of dollars in benefits. One man, Richard Costantino, received over $200,000 in payments, and another participant, Louis Hurtadoin, collected $470,395 in disability payments. Amongst those charged were two doctors who received kickbacks for giving bogus diagnosis. More than 100 applicants pleaded guilty, but most received no jail time as long as they paid back the money they stole. More than $1 million was seized from bank accounts with additional seizures expected. The district attorney's office received more than $25 million in restitution and forfeiture. Number one, socioeconomic matters. New York police officer Yaniris Jen Delion was involved in a medical insurance fraud scheme where she gave confidential information about car crash victims in exchange for payment. Anthony Rose, the alleged mastermind, paid thousands of dollars for protected patient information to give to insurance scammers. Those scammers would then steer the victims to a New York and New Jersey network of doctors and lawyers for unnecessary treatments. The scheme made over $18 million, operating from roughly 2014 to 2019. The scheme was based out of a call center in Queens, New York. Rose targeted people in, quote, the hood, since he felt that people in Manhattan could afford expensive attorneys. The operation comprised of at least 60,000 people's information. They paid NYPD employees and people working in federally funded hospitals as much as $4,000 monthly for patients' information. De Leon pleaded not guilty and was released on $50,000 bail. Her attorney claimed most of the charges in the indictment had nothing to do with her. It wasn't the first scheme that Anthony Rose helped run. He bribed his brother Frank Rose, a former field representative for the city of Linden's neighborhood redevelopment program, in exchange for roughly $1.3 million in construction services. Anthony, being a great father, admitted that Frank awarded two of his companies approximately 37 contracts that totaled $1,329,000 in exchange for the corrupt payments. A judge sentenced Frank rose to 60 months in federal prison for accepting corrupt cash payments and other benefits for giving favorable treatment to specific contractors. He also had to pay $189,000 in restitution to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. U.S. District Judge Ann E. Thompson granted the government's motion for Anthony's downward departure as his corruption in the case helped authorities stop the fraudulent scheme from continuing. He received a sentence of six months of house arrest. What are some of the strangest cases involving the most corrupt cops? Let's find out, starting with... Number 5. But she loves him! Fitness-conscious New York City cop, Alisa Badrakterevich, 
found herself at the center of an internal investigation after she allegedly attempted to steer narcotics detectives away from busting her boyfriend, a suspected dealer. It all went down during a routine traffic stop in the Bronx. During the investigation, Badrak Terevich was reassigned to desk duty and had her service weapons confiscated. Badrak Terevich, an officer serving with the Bronx robbery squad, met her boyfriend at the gym, and while the details of their relationship remained scarce, one thing was certain. Narcotics investigators had been keeping a close eye on this guy for some time, and they had warned her that he was a bad dude that would ultimately use her as a get-out-of-jail-free card. During a traffic stop, Police plan to search the vehicle of the man they referred to as a major player in the contraband trade with the intention of making an arrest for trafficking. But when it all started to go down, Badrek Terevich allegedly intervened, using her status as a cop to try and stop the situation. She refused to obey the other officers' instructions and they ended up having to call backup. It seems that the officers conducting the traffic stop didn't realize who she was until she revealed herself. Apparently, Bajrak Terevich created quite a scene and gave the detectives a hard time. Eventually, they decided to let her boyfriend go, but promptly filed a complaint with the Internal Affairs Bureau regarding her involvement. It's not entirely clear if the narcotics detectives ended up searching this guy's car during the chaos caused by Bajrak Terevich. This wasn't the first time she'd interfered with an investigation into this guy either, as she prevented a search of his apartment as well. Of course, she insisted that her boyfriend isn't a dealer. As of the release of the video, there hasn't been any public updates, and the NYPD would only acknowledge that Elisa's status with the force has been, quote, modified. Number four, Florida's worst cop. A Florida police sergeant named German Bosk has been fired from the Opalaka Police Department for the seventh time due to allegations of misconduct and criminal behavior. The incident leading to his termination occurred when officers were dispatched to a home after reports of an abandoned firearm. The night before, the Miami-Dade Police Department tried to arrest an armed felon and the missing weapon was believed to be connected to that incident. When he arrived at the scene, the responding officer, probably a rookie, located the weapon and notified dispatch. However, during the course of the investigation, the officer left the firearm unattended. Total rookie mistake. So he contacted his supervisor, Sergeant Bosk, who had already left the scene. When Bosk realized that the gun had been stolen, he immediately began coaching the officer with a fake story intended to cover up what happened. Body cam footage showed Bosk going through the cover-up story they planned to tell their colleagues, telling the other cop what to say, leading to Bosk getting fired. German Bosk's career has been marred by allegations of misconduct and criminal behavior. Over his 28-year career at the Opalaka Police Department, he was fired a staggering seven times. Some of the alleged violations included excessive force, stealing from suspects, misuse of police firearms, and false imprisonment. He also faced multiple arrests, although he was cleared of charges in some instances. Bosk's misconduct has received widespread attention, with the media often referring to him as Florida's worst cop. A 2011 article in the Sarasota Herald Tribune characterized his personnel file as more of a rap sheet than a resume. The report revealed over 40 internal affairs complaints against him, including 16 related to excessive force or battery. Bosk was found guilty of false imprisonment and witness tampering after illegally handcuffing a man who tried to file a complaint against him. Despite being sentenced to 364 days in jail, he didn't serve any time. An appeals court overturned a witness tampering conviction due to prosecutors failing to turn over police records to Boss defense during his trial. The state attorney's office decided not to retry him, and an arbitrator eventually gave him his job back. Bosk's attorney said his client denied any wrongdoing and planned a fight for reinstatement. He claimed that Bosk was just trying to determine a reasonable explanation for the officer's actions and wasn't trying to cover up the incident. Bosk's attorney also believed that the city failed to uphold basic due process and noted that Bosk was terminated and rehired seven times because each case against him was weak. However, city officials argue that Bosk's record of criminal and official misconduct should prevent him from ever working as a police officer again. They expressed frustration with the powerful police unions and employment arbitrators who have repeatedly reinstated Boss. They believed they hindered their ability to address and punish bad cops who tarnished the badge. And we're pretty sure we've heard little kids using the old I wasn't lying, I was explaining what could have happened defense though. And it never flies. Number three, unsolicited texts. 
Emily Hershowitz found herself in a bizarre web of deceit that led to her arrest. It all began when Hershowitz, an officer serving in the Ozinning Police Department, claimed she had been receiving menacing text messages. She said these messages were coming from multiple people, and she believed that one or more fellow police officers from her department were behind them. Hershowitz went to file further complaints, presenting investigators with screenshots of the messages. The content of these texts wasn't just threatening, but shockingly vile, filled with expletives and cruel taunts. Hershowitz was subjected to messages urging her to self-harm and demeaning her with derogatory terms. The situation escalated rapidly, and local authorities and her superiors became increasingly concerned about the disturbing nature of these messages. Fearing for her safety and well-being, they reached out to the Westchester District Attorney's Office to initiate a comprehensive investigation into the matter. The severity of the case prompted the police chief to call for a department-wide meeting to address the issue. Despite Hershowitz expressing her desire to to drop the complaint, her superiors remained committed to uncovering the truth. They couldn't ignore the gravity of the situation. As the investigation continued, suspicions began to mount, and eventually, authorities turned their focus toward Hershowitz herself. Eventually, investigators obtained a search warrant to look at Hershowitz's phone and online accounts. What they found sent shockwaves through the case. Evidence strongly showed she was associated with several of the phone numbers that sent the messages. It seemed more and more likely that she had been sending these messages herself. The revelation resulted in Hershowitz being arrested and charged with four counts of third degree falsely reporting an incident and three counts of first degree filing a false instrument, a felony charge that means that she knowingly filed a fraudulent report. Hershowitz's arrest was a huge betrayal to the law enforcement community. Her career, which had been characterized by accolades, took an unexpected and dramatic turn. She had joined the Azinning Police Department in 2016, and in just two years, she was named Employee of the Year by the local Rotary club. As the investigation continues to unfold, many questions remain unanswered. A former Ozenning police officer named Louis Rinaldi has been implicated as an accomplice in the case, with his name coming up over and over again during the investigation. Rinaldi resigned from the department due to separate disciplinary charges. With the seriousness of the messages, it's odd that she wouldn't think the department was going to fully investigate the issue. She works in a place with the resources to catch her, yet she still went through with her complaints. She was always going to get caught. Number two, hidden shoeboxes. In the bustling streets of London, Kashif Mahmood, a former Metropolitan Police officer, took a dark path down the rabbit hole of organized crime. It all began when Mahmood, cop, found himself entangled in the world of a crime gang led by a man in Dubai known as Mutjaba Niaz Mand. Niaz Mand communicated with the UK-based gang members through the encrypted Encro Chat mobile phone network, believing their secrets were safe. The gang's M.O. was simple, just target people transporting large sums of cash. Nia's man would tip off the gang's leader in the UK, Motion Khan, about the jobs. Motion, going by the nickname Aqua Plus on EncroChat, would then contact Kashif. Mahmood, using police cars and wearing his uniform, would intercept the targets. To add to this criminal duo, Johan Gurgel, a Romanian bodybuilder, played the role of his law enforcement accomplice. Together, they would orchestrate fake police stops, confiscating the money meant for the the gang's illicit transactions. These couriers, who had been handed the cash by the Khan gang, found themselves robbed not only of their money, but also at risk from their criminal associates. The scheme proved to be successful, with the gang amassing over a million pounds, until Mahmood's body camera accidentally activated during one such operation, captured evidence that would eventually lead to his downfall. As the investigations revealed the extent of their activities, the Khan gang's empire began to crumble. Surveillance officers coincidentally observing one of the the gang's operations, stumbled upon Mahmood and Gurgle. Mahmood had a wife, Shireen, who remained oblivious to her husband's double life. As the court proceedings unfolded, it came out that Shireen had been manipulated into helping her husband. She confessed to moving a box under his instructions during a police raid on their home. The box believed to contain a large amount of cash was never recovered. Kashif Mahmood was sentenced to eight years in prison for his role in the organized crime group, while the Khan brothers received up to 16 years. Gurgle, partner in crime, was jailed for for six years. As for Shireen, she was handed a suspended sentence of 20 months. Number one, they just knew it. 
Ross Cates and his wife, Liz Mixel Batista, became characters in a real-life drama involving illegal search and seizure, questionable police conduct, and a dancer's supposedly hard-earned singles of almost $20,000. The story began on the day when Cates and Batista were pulled over by the Miami-Dade Police Department for allegedly cutting off a police cruiser. What should have been a routine traffic stop took a dramatic turn when the officers discovered six guns in the couple's car. Officers seized nearly $20,000 in cash as well as suspected illegal substances. This discovery led to serious charges, including armed trafficking and other felonies against Cates and Batista. Defense attorneys for the couple challenged the arrest after officers bragged about the weapon to local media outlets. The lawyers argued that the cops hadn't followed proper protocol during the search. Cates maintained that he legally owned the weapons and held a valid concealed weapons permit. Body cam footage from the incident revealed that an officer never obtained Cates' permission to search the vehicle's trunk. Instead, the officer commanded Cates to pop the trunk rendering the search illegal. The real plot twist came with Batista's involvement. She worked as a dancer and held a significant amount of cash, which was discovered in her purse during the traffic stop. She explained to the officers that she was on the way to the bank to deposit the money. However, the police department's legal bureau saw things differently. They believed the cash was connected to illegal activities, and so they kept it. Police claimed that a canine named Roxy had alerted officers that the cash had been near narcotics. During a hearing to determine whether the police could retain the money, Batista's colleague, Haley Heath, testified that her friend earned big money at work. She argued that the glitter on the cash should have made it pretty clear where that money came from, considering Batista's profession. Ultimately, a Miami-Dade circuit judge concluded that there was no probable cause for the seizure and ordered the cash to be returned to the couple. Additionally, the police department agreed to cover the couple's legal fees, amounting to approximately $3,000. So what really happened that day? Yes, the cops didn't do the proper protocol, but were they actually really believing that Kate's and Batista were completely lying and that they were stopping a criminal operation in progress? Or were the cops actually crooked like Alonzo in Training Day trying to get a little extra cash on the side? Let us know what you think in the comment section. The motto of the police department is to protect and serve, but these officers did the opposite. Let's get right to it with... Number 5. Copping Out Delray Beach police officer Shakaria Stringer collected thousands of dollars while lying about being on military leave. Jacaria claimed to spend 21 days on assembly training with the U.S. Army Reserve and submitted fake timesheets with the Delray Beach Police Department. The city paid her $6,533 for her alleged military leave. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement opened an investigation into Jacaria's actions when the Delray Beach Police Department questioned her timesheets. An investigator contacted the military police who confirmed that Jacaria was marked as absent for the day she claimed to have been in training. Additionally, there was no training scheduled on six of the days that she claimed there was. The police department placed her on administrative leave and the state attorney's office opened a criminal investigation into Jacaria's training. Investigators discovered that she lied and submitted fake paperwork. On the advice of her attorney, Jacaria didn't provide a statement during questioning by a Florida Department of Law Enforcement investigator. She was arrested in March 2022 and underwent involuntary separation from the U.S. Army Reserve. Jacaria made headlines after the story of her father, Jeffrey Stringer's incarceration became public. Jeffrey spent two decades Decades behind bars after receiving a life sentence on non-violent offenses of illegal substances. In the late 90s, Jeffrey Stringer was arrested and charged with manufacturing and intending to distribute illegal substances. Years later, his case garnered national attention due to his harsh sentence for non-violent crimes. A judge ruled that Jeffrey should be released based on the First Step Act, a law that allows specific non-violent offenders to earn credits toward early release for good behavior. Kim Kardashian brought attention to Jeffrey's case and spoke to his relatives on FaceTime shortly after the ruling. Jakaria gave interviews where she spoke about never seeing her father on the outside and thought she never would. Number 4. Sticky Fingers 
Giancarlo Diginova, a Vermont state trooper, allegedly stole $40,000 worth of items from an evidence storage locker and bought prescription medication without a prescription while on duty. In November 2022, troopers at the police barracks in Williston, Vermont, struggled to find several items they'd seized from someone they arrested. They were supposed to be inside the barracks' temporary evidence room, but the evidence was apparently way too temporary because they weren't in there at all. The troopers were searching for a gold Rolex men's watch, stud earrings, keys, a wallet, and some AirPods. The Genova had accessed the storage area multiple times between the items being stored there and his co-workers realizing they were gone. For the discovery, the Genova flaunted a watch similar to the Rolex that was missing. He told a co-worker that he bought it for $700 to $800 from an online marketplace, but after showing it to a local jeweler, he learned it was a counterfeit. The Genova grew agitated when one of the investigators questioned him about the watch. He changed his story saying he bought it from his cousin who lived four hours away. The Genova said he returned the watch after learning it was fake but didn't have any receipts or even messages with his cousin where he discussed the purchase. Then he said it was for his son's Christmas present but immediately changed his story to say it was for his son's birthday. The Genova implied that other troopers mishandled evidence and alluded to knowing things that happened in the past like evidence getting flushed. He threatened investigators saying he had information in his back pocket and would be furious if none of his co-workers received the same treatment. Vermont State Police suspended him the same day as the interview. While searching DiGenova's police vehicle, investigators found a business card for Periwinkle, a local Rolex dealer and jewelry store. The owner told police that DiGenova visited the store in uniform and asked her to appraise the value of a gold Rolex watch, claiming it was from a case he was working on. The owner estimated the watch's value at $14,000, stating it would be worth more with the box or proper documentation. But DiGenova said he only had the watch. When police searched his home, they discovered other potential missing pieces of evidence, such as a cell phone and a pair of diamond earrings. The department also accused DiGenova of stealing a bag of seized cell phones in June 2021 and later trying to sell them at a kiosk in his local mall. Among the stolen goods were several bottles of ADHD medication intended for a child, which he may have taken after responding to a domestic disturbance. When investigators reviewed DiGenova's email account, they discovered he checked vehicle identification numbers on behalf of a household member's car registration business. A mandatory part of those checks was performing physical inspections. While the Genova claimed to have done two in-person checks on out-of-state trucks, he allegedly never saw the vehicles. The former state trooper resigned several months after being placed on leave. In March 2023, state police filed charges against him, including 16 misdemeanors and four felony charges. He pleaded not guilty at his arraignment. If convicted, Diginova faces up to 60 years in prison. Things actually happen in Vermont? We always assume the police just had to deal with maple syrup offenses. Number three, the blessing circle. Reginald Jones, a Dallas police officer, ran a pyramid scheme involving multiple officers and at least 159 participants. Jones operated a blessing circle in which he recruited individuals to pay money to participants who would then recruit new participants to receive money. Participants paid anything from $100 to $500 to $1,400 for gifting circles through Cash App. The goal was to receive blessings, which were forms of payment. However, to receive a blessing, you needed to give one. Jones convinced participants that they would receive four or five times the original amount when they gave a blessing, meaning if someone paid $100, they could get back around $500. Participants needed to bring in at least two new people to receive blessings from eight people. Jones recruited while he was in uniform, including approaching construction workers while he was supposed to be blocking traffic. When his department learned of Jones's scheme, they issued a warrant for his arrest. Investigators discovered he likely wasn't working alone and placed a dozen other officers on administrative leave. Jones claimed, through his lawyer, that he intended to run a gifting tree and didn't think his actions could be interpreted as illegal. He made $48,000 through the operation. However, operating a pyramid scheme is a felony in Texas, and he faced at least six months in jail and a $10,000 fine if convicted. Number two, pending charges. 
Florida cop Diane Ferreira stole a deceased man's credit card to pay for a hotel stay and eyelash extensions. Ferreira responded to a 911 call of a man who was in cardiac arrest. An emergency crew found deceased upon arrival. She took a picture of the man's credit card during the call. Then Ferreira went on a shopping spree, getting beauty treatments, a hotel room, seven mobile food purchases, and a meal at Wendy's, all charged the stolen card. Several weeks later, the man's grieving widow discovered a series of suspicious purchases on his credit card bill, which were made after he had passed away. Pereira also tried to pay for gas, but the card declined as his widow had alerted the credit card company. She also reported the fraudulent credit card activity to authorities who investigated the case. Investigators obtained a description of the fraudster's car and discovered that it matched a vehicle belonging to one of their own. Pereira admitted to taking snapshots of the card, storing them in her phone, and using the information to make a series of purchases. She was arrested shortly after her confession. Number one, the worst type of cop. Andrew Mitchell abused his power as a Columbus police officer when he used his uniform to intimidate and manipulate women. Mitchell worked in law enforcement for 31 years, and he was also a landlord with 15 properties registered to his name. Despite his day job, Mitchell received 37 violations on his properties for issues such as housing code violations and environmental issues. His tenants described their housing as pest-ridden and neglected. Even with the poor conditions of his units, the police officer constantly evicted people with 381 evictions since 1996. In some cases, Mitchell offered alternate payment methods. When one of his tenants fell behind on rent after losing her job, she asked if there were any jobs she could do to reduce the cost of her rent. Mitchell offered her jobs painting and picking up trash outside of his apartment complexes. One day, while she was painting one of Mitchell's properties, he turned up and stood over her, asking if she'd ever considered sending promiscuous photos. He said he would reduce her rent by a substantial amount, but she refused. A few days later, he approached her again, warning her that if she was going to send the photos, she had to do it soon. Again, she tried to blow it off, but he wouldn't stop pushing her. Mitchell overheard the hard-up tenant talking to a friend about doing adult entertainment work online as a way of making money, causing him to be even more forceful with his advances. The next time he pressed her, she declared that she no longer wanted to do work for discounted rent. But that wasn't good enough for Mitchell, who insisted that if she wasn't willing to work for him, she had to send him the photos. Soon after, he evicted her for non-payment of rent. Another tenant was in a bad financial situation when Mitchell rented a unit to her. The woman was pregnant at the time and urgently needed housing. A friend referred her to Mitchell, who would supposedly let her move in without a deposit and be lenient about rent payments. Although it seemed too good to be true, since he was a police officer, the woman trusted him. Soon after moving in, he barged her with inappropriate requests, pressuring her to do explicit things to shave money off rent. She denied his advances, so he forced her out as well. The bad cops tenants weren't the only people he attempted to coerce. When he worked in the vice unit, he handled solicitation cases, but he used his authority to kidnap women. On several occasions, he pretended to arrest victims, transported them to a different location, and forced them to perform explicit acts in exchange for their freedom. After a citizen complaint, Mitchell became the subject of an internal investigation, but the deputy chief didn't suspend him due to lack of evidence. Less than a week later, he was working undercover when he arrested Donna Castleberry for solicitation charges. When she was inside the unmarked vehicle, she cried for help, shouting that he was going to kidnap her. Castleberry fought him by taking a knife to his hand, and he reacted by grabbing his gun, an altercation that ended with the unfortunate passing of Castleberry. A witness overheard the exchange and rushed to the car, where she saw Mitchell pushing Castleberry's body into the rear seat in an attempt to hide it. When Mitchell saw the witness, he told her he was a police officer and that he was injured. After taking Castleberry's life, the Columbus Police Department relieved Mitchell of duty. A federal grand jury indicted him on seven counts, including deprived victims of civil rights while acting under the color of the law and obstruction of justice. Additionally, Mitchell attempted to tamper with two witnesses in the federal case where he faced charges of witness tampering and he lied to investigators where he was charged with making false statements to federal agents. Who are a few of the most corrupt cops you don't want to come across? Let's find out, starting with... Number 5. Six corrupt cops, one corrupted minor. Six corrupt cops were charged after their unsavory interactions with a then 19-year-old call girl who went by the name Celeste Guap. Her real name is Jasmine Abuslin. She claimed that the police retained her for servicing officers and that she was forced to provide 
provide adult favors in return for protection, money, and other forms of consideration. The scandal got nationwide attention after Officer Brandon O'Brien intentionally kicked the bucket when he learned that Guap had plans to contact the police to expose him and others. However, O'Brien wasn't the only one. Guap has gone on to mention six other officers that she claims sent her obscene texts and had intimate relations with her. One of the six officers is Lieutenant Andre Hill, who had intimate relations with Guap in her home. He was eventually fired by the police. Another implicated officer is Lieutenant Felix Tan, a 20-year veteran who had served as the chief of staff to the police chief in the city. According to Guap, Tan had exchanged obscene texts with her as well. Despite the severity of his crime, Tan merely received a letter of reprimand. Sergeant Gerard Tong wasn't as lucky as Tan. Tong had gone much further with Guap than Tan had, so he was fired by the police department. The other three officers accused by Guap are Sergeant Terrence Jackson, Mike Rude, and Armando Moreno. Jackson had been intimate with Guap while on duty and uniform, so the department made moves to fire him. However, his appeal was successful and he was reinstated, but with lower pay. Rude didn't have intimate relations with Guap, but he, like Tan, exchanged obscene texts with her. When asked why, Rude had the brilliant answer that he had wanted to meet with her just to let her know that he wasn't interested. Moreno, on the other hand, did the deed with Guap off duty. But those six Guap accused weren't the only officers implicated in the scandal. According to internal investigations, 11 officers were eventually implicated. Three were kicked off the force, six received letters of reprimand, and two quit the force before they could be punished. Number four, dropping 40 bars. Policewoman Haley Mae Greenwood was arrested for dealing ice on the job, and her reaction to that was to make a rap video about it. It's as weird as it sounds. And Greenwood wasn't just arrested for moonlighting as a dealer while on duty. She was also arrested for lying to the police about a friend of her accomplice. She was immediately suspended from the force and has since pleaded guilty to one charge of corruption and another three charges of illegal substance dealing. And Greenwood, ever the optimist, was ready to pivot it to a potential rapping career. In fact, she let it ignite her. Doesn't she look more like some mom from the 90s that only peripherally understands what rap is, though? Greenwood always had an interest in music and has a profile on music website Reverb Nation that describes her as a female instrumentalist, vocalist, songwriter, and composer who's just about willing to give any style of music a try. The catch was that Greenwood wasn't only willing to give music a try, but she was also willing to give being a criminal while working as a cop a try. And you're probably as surprised as we are to learn that it didn't pan out quite as well as she thought it would. In her rap video, she calls herself Batman, which is weird because Batman certainly doesn't fight crime by selling illegal substances. Greenwood also said that she didn't care whether her thoughts about being Batman are fake or reality, which is good because it shows she's not totally nuts, just really stupid. Number three, The Departed in Real Life. Officer Beznik Liakatura worked for years as a criminal enforcer for Albanian crime boss Redanel Dervisaj. And Liakatura wasn't just your average corrupt cop either. He was a big part of the criminal enterprise that Dervisaj was running. Liakatura was bought all the way into the organization. He was like a bad movie corrupt cop. Liakatura had once promised the owner of a seafood restaurant that not many nice things would occur if he didn't pay the protection money that his boss demanded. He also once held another owner at bay while the man was hit by Dervisage himself. Fortunately for residents and business people in the area, Lakatura's reign didn't last long. He was soon arrested and charged. Lakatura's hearing revealed other stories from other people who'd been victimized by Lakatura and Dervisage. For one, after he got arrested, Lakatura ordered members of his family to go after his victims who were cooperating with the police. The government also found out that Lakatura, who was married, wasn't exactly the nicest with his girlfriend. The woman in question also testified that he had placed a GPS in her car to track her and had once flushed her head in the toilet. Just what? According to his attorney, Lakatura had simply made a mistake and didn't understand the consequences of what he was doing, which is sort of a weird excuse to give for being an enforcer to a crime boss while being a police officer. It seems like even his defense attorney didn't even know how 
how to defend that monster. We're all willing to wager that Lakatura knew exactly what he was doing when he worked for Dervisage. It's even more unsettling when you consider the fact that Lakatura had once won three meritorious police duty medals, which is like a gold star for cops. But in spite of being recognized as a good cop by his department, he still found employment with Dervisage and worked with him to scare residents. Thankfully, justice was served and Lakatura was sentenced to 14 years and three months in prison. His boss was also found guilty of a host of criminal activities and he was sentenced to 57 years in prison. Law enforcement is a hard enough job as it is without these guys going around making people distrust cops even more. Number two, Grandma Deals. Joanne Segovia ran an international illegal substances ring from her home and office computers, all while being the executive director of the Police Officers Association. Everything about this crime is absurd. First, Segovia is a 64-year-old grandmother with two grandkids. According to police officers and people who knew her, she was a cheerful woman who had a smile for everyone who spoke to her. Secondly, she was the executive director of the police union and supervised two other employees. While Segovia has never actually been a police officer, she's been working with the union since 2003. According to police officers, this meant that she was at least informally part of the police and was tied by the same code of conduct that governed police conduct. So Segovia didn't just break some obscure code of conduct. Segovia ran a criminal enterprise that put maybe thousands of synthetic pills on the streets. Segovia had accepted at least 61 illegal shipments from Hong Kong, India, Indonesia, and Singapore, and distributed her packages from her home. And no one but Segovia herself knew about this. She lived with her husband, a military veteran and former butcher, and hid all her dealings from him as well. When the packages of substances arrived, she would label them wedding party favors or chocolates and sweets. The police eventually started tracking Segovia's packages. One time, she logged into her work computer and used the police union UPS account to move some of the pills she had ordered. The police also tracked her other packages and got evidence that she was importing the pills and had set up an expansive distribution network for them. Some of the packages that they had intercepted contained thousands of the pills. They also believe that some of those pills have directly led to an overdose. Police also discovered encrypted WhatsApp text messages between her and her suppliers. This was the primary way she coordinated her shipments, and it was evidence that she had been running the ring for at least three years. The police say she has been running the operation for at least eight years. However, Segovia has denied the allegations. Instead, she claims that the mastermind of the entire thing was her housekeeper, who was a family friend. Right. The housekeeper was the one pulling the strings, making her go to work and use police computers. In any case, Segovia was charged with unlawfully importing substances and faced 20 years in prison if convicted. Convicted. Her case is still ongoing. It's one thing for substances to be out on the street, like, that's gonna happen. Crazy thing about this is Segovia was dealing a particular pill that is a major problem that's getting worse. We're not going to name it, but it starts with an F. Anyway, it's taking the lives of teenagers left and right, and she's got grandkids that age. Like, what are you doing? She works with law enforcement, so she knows the effects. What's the thought process here? Number one, the impersonator. Jeremy DeWitt isn't a cop, but he'd do everything possible to become one. And this includes being the sort of corrupt cop that gives other cops bad names. DeWitt is America's most dedicated cop impersonator and his entire impersonation shtick goes back at least 15 years. DeWitt lost the chance to become a real cop when he was convicted of a heinous crime that involved a minor when he was 25. So, before we all start feeling bad for this guy and his shattered dreams, trust us, he shouldn't be a cop. The conviction sent DeWitt to jail for a year and forced him to register with the local PD wherever he lives. We'll let you figure it out. But did DeWitt let that stop him from pursuing his goal of being a cop anyway? No, it didn't. He decided that if he couldn't be a genuine cop, he would be a fake cop. So he started a company called Metro State Services that technically existed to provide escort rides for funerals. But instead of merely conducting funeral escort services, DeWitt took his act up a notch and gave it a bit more panache. He painted his vehicles, all 18 of them, in what looked suspiciously like cop colors, recruited other wannabe cops, and gave them uniforms that looked like they belonged to a police department. These uniforms tricked other motorists into believing that DeWitt and his men were actual cops, 
and made them obey their traffic directions. But this little bit of power wasn't enough for DeWitt. DeWitt made sure he looked as close to a cop as he could without technically wearing a cop's uniform. He wore black high boots, a tight-fitting police-style uniform with badges that closely resembled real police badges. He had a white helmet and drove a BMW motorcycle with flashing lights. He even wore a body camera because, you know, what if someone needed evidence that he was committing a crime? You think that's going to come back to haunt him? While he was playing dress-up, DeWitt would make sure to exert authority he didn't have by standing at intersections and controlling traffic, pulling people over, breaking traffic rules, and even threatening motorists who went against him. He also armed himself with a pepper spray that very closely resembled a service weapon. In footage obtained from his own body camera, DeWitt is seen weaving through traffic on his motorcycle at extremely high speeds. He rode against oncoming traffic and pulled over motorists over and over again. Everything was going good until DeWitt unwittingly pulled over an off-duty Orange County Sheriff's deputy who was driving with his wife and kid. DeWitt slammed the front fender of the vehicle and threatened to use his pepper spray by placing his hands on his holster. The deputy called 911 and drove off, but discovered that he was being followed by some of DeWitt's employees who was also dressed like police officers. One of them was subsequently arrested for carrying a genuine firearm in a holster on his belt, and somehow that didn't get him busted. DeWitt carried on like this for a long time until the police finally decided to open an investigation into his antics, but only after he confronted yet another police officer. This interaction forced the police to open a broad investigation into his business. In due course, he was arrested for impersonating police officers. DeWitt took a plea that saw him go to prison for 18 months, but with 110 days served. The conviction also covered 10 different cases against him, which were all centered on impersonation. Under the plea agreement, he cannot possess firearms or any other equipment that resembles any sort of actual law enforcement equipment, including vehicles and uniforms. Before DeWitt went off to jail, he decided to draw public sympathy for his cause by appearing on the Dr. Phil show and claiming to be unjustly targeted. He said that his assault case was years ago and had nothing to do with his current police trouble. He also said he was a legitimate business person just doing his business. He asked for a polygraph test to be conducted on his claims to legitimate but even the test confirmed that he was being deceptive. Can you imagine what kind of cop this guy would have been had he actually been able to apply? We have a feeling we'd be doing stories on this guy no matter what. Who are some of the most corrupt cops out there? Let's find out, starting with... Number 7, Yesenia Jimenez. Yesenia Jimenez, a former NYPD officer, faced a federal court conviction on trafficking charges stemming from her involvement in a dealing operation that she and her boyfriend, Luis Soto, had. Jimenez, a four-year veteran of the NYPD, was assigned to patrol city housing developments in the Bronx and was found to have been running an illicit operation in collaboration with Soto. Their operation extended across the U.S.-Mexico border trafficking a range of contraband that was distributed from their apartment to buyers in New York and Boston. Authorities had initially become suspicious of Jimenez when her boyfriend's phone number surfaced in connection with a suspected dealer from Queens, New York. The unraveling of Jimenez's double life began when she and Soto were apprehended by DEA agents upon returning from a trip to Massachusetts. The duo was meeting another trafficker at the time. Adding to the situation, Jimenez had her NYPD-issued firearm visibly hanging out of her purse and was carrying $25,000 in cash. When law enforcement raided Jimenez's apartment, they discovered not only hundreds of thousands of dollars in contraband money, but also a substantial quantity of illegal substances. Jimenez tried to claim that she was just on the job, but nobody, including a jury, bought it. So she was convicted following a one-week trial in a Manhattan federal court. In her conviction, Jimenez was found guilty of conspiring to distribute various substances and using a firearm in furtherance of trafficking. She now faces a mandatory 10-year prison sentence for the conspiracy charges with the potential for a life sentence. Number 6. William Dickey 
William Dickey and his wife Tara Yusufero face charges of misdemeanor shoplifting after allegedly leaving a Lowe's home improvement store without paying. Store surveillance footage clearly captured the incident, showing Dickey, an officer with the Providence, Rhode Island Police Department, pushing a cart filled with insulation worth only $66 past the register without any intention of paying for it. His wife Tara was seen doing the same thing with a window air conditioner worth $379. Really? risking it all just to save less than $500. Acknowledging their alleged crime, Dickey and Yusufero quickly turned themselves in to the Warwick Police Department. The fact that Dickey was an officer with the Providence Police Department raised additional concerns. He has since been suspended from his position and is currently the subject of an internal review by his own department. Both individuals were subsequently booked and released with a summons to appear for arraignment in Kent County District Court with charges of misdemeanor shoplifting. It's really weird that he decided to to throw his entire career away for less than $500. Maybe his house was just really, really hot, and one more minute of delay was unacceptable. I'd pay for all this, but it's like 85 out, and I just can't take it. Number five, Mesut Caracas. Mesut Caracas, a former police officer in London, was revealed to be the ringleader of a gang that planned to abduct a bank manager and his spouse in hopes of stealing 100,000 pounds. But Scotland Yard, which is the coolest named police force, detectives had other ideas. In conversations recorded by a bug planted in his car, Caracas and his accomplices discussed their intentions in detail. They talked about using sheets to transport the victims and planning about an hour and a half for interrogation. The elaborate plot even included staging a roadwork scene near the victim's residence to serve as a distraction during the kidnapping. When police moved in and arrested Caracas and his gang, they uncovered a trove of incriminating evidence in their homes. Balaclavas, tape, zip ties, ear protection, and a van equipped with fake plates were among the items seized. Caracas and his fellow gang members all faced charges related to the kidnapping plot and its aftermath. Interestingly, there were signs of suspicion surrounding Caracas even before the arrest. He had been suspected of having ties to major criminal groups in London. Doubts were also raised about his conduct when he supposedly injured himself to frame a suspect and later engaged in a fight with some guy outside a pub. Ultimately, Masut Caracas was sentenced to a prison term of 14 years for his role in the plot. The story is a little old, but still blows us away at how corrupt this guy was. He's like a corrupt cop in a movie. It's not like he was just taking bribes or something. This dude was out acting like a straight up villain, just like Alonzo from Training Day. And it's not like it was that much money. Don't get us wrong, 100,000 pounds is still a lot, but splitting it even 50%, it's not like he could ride off into the sunset or something. Number four, Anthony Maldonado. Anthony Ikeka Maldonado, a former Maui police officer, attempted to bribe a man he basically mugged into not telling on him. The story began with a routine traffic stop. Maldonado, working as a Lahaina patrol officer at the time, pulled over a driver who was alone in the car and struggled with English. During the stop, Maldonado stole around $1,800 from the driver's fanny pack after searching it. The victim later realized the money was missing and reported the theft to the police. As the investigation into the theft unfolded, it came to light that Maldonado, along with four others, including fellow police officers, had attempted to bribe the victim to get him to withdraw the complaint. Maldonado's friend, approached the victim at his residence and offered him $2,000, which the guy rejected. The victim eventually accepted $1,800, but said it was just to make the guy go away. As if stealing money from the victim during a traffic stop wasn't already dumb enough, attempting to silence the victim through bribery, especially after he had already reported the theft, is even dumber. And then insisting the victim take the bribe after he made it clear he didn't want it is even more dumber. In the aftermath of the investigation and court proceedings, justice was served as Mal Maldonado was sentenced to two years in prison. Alongside the prison term, he was placed on three years of supervised release and ordered to pay restitution of $1,917.70. Isn't it usually the other way around where people try to bribe police? Maybe someone should give these guys a memo or something. Number three, John Pisano. 
Former Lieutenant John Pisano was a 20-year veteran of the NYPD when allegations surfaced about his unauthorized use of overtime to engage in gym sessions instead of performing his duties. Accused of sneaking into the basement gym at one police plaza during work hours, Pisano is said to have exploited the overtime system. Allegedly, Pisano scammed a total of 5 hours and 25 minutes of overtime during 8 exercise sessions, making use of the gym instead of fulfilling his professional responsibilities. On top of his base salary of $121, $1,000, the alleged misuse of overtime pushed his total pay to $176,000, according to information from the Empire Center's See-Through NY website. Similar patterns were observed in previous years, with his total earnings reaching $177,000 and $173,000. Disciplinary charges filed against Pisano said that he failed to sign in or out of the NYPD gym as required, totaling 92 times. While some incidents occurred during his regular working hours, the lack of proper documentation raised concerns concerns about his commitment to his duties. In addition to this, Pisano was accused of leaving work early on 195 occasions without proper approvals or documentation. Refusing a deal to avoid a departmental trial, Pisano's case highlights the seriousness with which the department views such behavior. If found guilty of the charges, Pisano faces a range of potential consequences, including the loss of 30 vacation days or even forced retirement. But is his misuse of overtime a scam or just a regular thing people do? Realistically, he only took five and a half hours of overtime to work out, which isn't the same as robbing people or dealing contraband, and certainly wasn't responsible for his jump in annual pay. On the other hand, people in a position of authority are held to a different standard as they should be. In a job where your integrity very much matters, anything that displays a lack of integrity can have far-reaching consequences. So, even the slightest hint of dishonesty or questionable behavior can erode trust, damaging the reputation not only of the person involved, but the entire organization they represent. Also, did you ever have a boss like that? Or have you done something similar? Give us your take in the comments below. Number two, Michael Conway. Michael Conway, a former NYPD lieutenant, got himself into some legal trouble for a significant fraud involving social security benefits meant for his own children. The accusations revolve around his alleged theft of nearly $140,000 in social security benefits over almost a decade. The situation began when Conway qualified for benefits due to a work-related injury he sustained during his time in the NYPD. He allegedly then went on to falsely claim social security benefits on behalf of his twin children who were eight years old at the time. Shockingly, one of these children is legally blind. Conway's actions extended for nearly a decade, during which he allegedly kept the funds for himself. The fraud finally came to light when Conway's blind son applied for benefits through the Social Security Administration. The teenager discovered that SSA had been providing benefits to both him and his twin for nearly 10 years, and it was revealed that Conway had misappropriated over $138,000. Apparently, Conway's ex-wife and the mother of the twins was also totally unaware of his fraud. She had told the SSA that she had custody of the children and that they had never even lived with Conway. The U.S. Attorney of the Eastern District of New York emphasized the gravity of the situation, stating that Conway had committed a fraud on both his family and the government by unlawfully obtaining and keeping funds intended for his children's care. Conway faced charges of wire fraud, which could potentially result in a prison sentence of up to 20 20 years. Despite the allegations, he was released on a $200,000 bond. It's one thing to find out he was getting benefits from the children intended to help with their care. We don't always know how people spend their money, so just because his family wasn't aware of the aid didn't mean that the money wasn't going to help the kids. But then to find out his kids never even lived with him, you're a great guy, Michael. We're sure you've done your boys proud. Number one, Caleb Rogers. Caleb Rogers was a former Las Vegas police officer accused of orchestrating a series of daring casino heists and stealing close to $165,000. At the time of the robberies, Roger was an active duty patrol officer entrusted with uploading the law and maintaining public safety. However, he faced accusations of carrying out three casino heists over a four month period. In the span of those four months, Rogers allegedly made off with nearly $165,000 from robberies at hotels 
hotel casinos, including the Red Rock Resort and Aliante Hotel. His approach was consistent across the heist. Wearing a face mask, dark clothing, and black latex gloves, he presented a weapon, allegedly a police-issued one, and intimidated cashiers into giving him money. Once the cash was handed over, he concealed it beneath a bag tucked inside his jacket. In his third robbery at the Rio in Las Vegas, Rogers was apprehended by security guards after a brief struggle. Armed with his department-issued revolver and wearing body armor, Rogers threatened cashiers and forcibly took about $79,000. As he attempted to leave the premises, a group of security guards intervened, leading to a tense standoff. After his arrest, Rogers' defense attorney said that the government's evidence tying him to two of the robberies is weak. He claimed that the FBI and Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department detectives pressured individuals into identifying him as the suspect in the robberies to hastily close the cases. One striking aspect of the case is that Caleb Rogers' own brother, Josiah Rogers, identified him on video footage captured by casino security cameras during the first two robberies. Josiah Rogers received immunity from prosecution for his cooperation. Currently, Caleb Rogers remains in custody awaiting trial for the charges brought against him. Why he'd think it's a good idea to try and rob places that have more cameras than any place else in the world is anyone's guess. Rogers also has a particular way of walking due to a limp, making him even more easily identified. Maybe next time he could just walk in and present his ID before demanding the cash, just to save everyone a little bit of time. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section on a sliding scale from 1 to 10, how much you agree with defunding the police, with 1 being completely disagree and a 10 with completely agree.